Okay, so these are gram-positive rods or gram-positive bacilli. Okay, the first, first one is uh, genus Corini bacterium, not corny bacterium, Corini. Okay, Corini bacterium. Uh, these are irregular, non spore forming gram positive rods, and these are club shaped, okay, wide on one end and thin on the other. So they look like clubs, okay, Corini bacterium look like clubs. The catalase positive, and they're non acid fast. Um, the main organism, the main pathogen of Corinibacterium is Corinibacterium diphtheria. Another name for Corinibacterium diphtheria is the Klebs Loeffler's bacillus. So I told you two bacillus tonight. One's Hansen's bacillus, which is uh, Mycobacterium leprae, that's leprosy, and Klebs Loeffler bacillus, and that's diphtheria. Diphtheria is a pretty serious disease. Uh, and then there's Corinibacterium pseudotuberculosis, cirrhosis, pseudodiphtheriticum, and JKM. Okay, JKM. Uh, that used to be called JK bacillus, so two letters JK. Um, but the, the organism is Corinibacterium JKM. Clinical significance. First one is, first and probably the only one that's of clinical significance is Corinibacterium diphtheria. Um, diphtheria is a disease spread by respiratory droplets, uh, contact with cutaneous lesions, and uh, contact with contaminated objects. It produces a cytotoxin. Uh, it'll make you really sick. Uh, respiratory uh, symptoms, you can get a, a bad pharyngitis. Cutaneous, you get non-healing ulcers. So there's two ways that you can get it, through respiratory or skin contact. Okay. Pictures, pictures of unfortunate people with diphtheria. Uh, Corinibacterium cirrhosis. It's an opportunistic pathogen causing endocarditis and septicemia. Pseudotuberculosis causes pneumonia and granulomatous lymphadenitis. Uh, Pseudodiphtheriticum diphther, will cause pneumonia, lung abscesses, and associated with endocarditis. So cross Corinibacterium diphtheria. You have to, if, when you collect your cultures, it has to be nasopharyngeal swabs or oropharyngeal cultures. And the specific type of swab, you can't just go to your supply room and just get a regular cotton tip swab. It has to be a calcium alginate swab. So make sure you know calcium alginate swab for uh, collecting Corinibacterium diphtheria have the patient open his mouth and then you swab it. And when you go in there, you don't wanna to touch the lateral walls, okay? You go straight down the middle, okay? And again, using a calcium alginate swab. And there's an illustration right there. Okay, go straight down the middle, don't touch the sides. Okay, media. Um, this is not the media choice, but um, the media to for primary isolation is cysteine telluride auger. There's another auger that you'll need to know, but for culture, blood auger, chocolate uh, auger, and cysteine telluride auger for the primary isolation of crony diphtheria. Potassium telluride is an inhibitor. And on this auger, colonies will be gray or black. So you will kind of need to know it, but it's not the official media of choice. On the gram stain, Corinne diphtheria is a gram positive rod. This lecture, remember, is a gram positive rod. Um, these rods have a particular arrangement and it's either gonna be a picket fence where it lines like uh, a picket fence, like pencils lined next to each other, or, um, in, ran, in random arrangement, like and it, it'll appear to look like Chinese characters. So the two descriptions for Corinne diphtheria on the gram stain are picket fence and Chinese characters. Okay, picket fence and Chinese characters. And it'll grow on cellulite, cellulene, excuse me, cysteine telluride auger, 
and the colonies are gray or black colonies. Okay, three biotypes on blood auger plate for coronary diphtheria: the gravis and the mitis. Gravis and the mitis biotype. You got you have medium, white, and opaque colonies. For intermediates, you have small, gray, and translucent. Okay, so make sure you know the difference between gravis mitis and intermediates. This is the media that I was talking about, the modified Tinsdale media. It's kind of like, you know, GC will grow on GC or Neisseria gonorrhea will grow on chocolate, fine. But if you, want, if you really want to keep the organism alive, you want to do it on modified Thera Martin. So for crony diphtheria, you can use the, the, the cellulant, so cysteine telluride auger, but specifically you can use modified Tinsdale medium because this media, this, uh, media will support the growth of all species of crony bacterium while inhibiting normal flora. Uh, cysteine sodium thiosulfate telluride and the colonies on modified Tinsdale media are black colonies with a brown halo. So black colonies with a brown halo on a modified testine, Tinsdale media. Inoculation, isolation, stab to enhance the brown, stab the media to enhance color. Interpretation, the brown halo will show up 10 to 12 hours after uh, planting onto the media. And it may take 48 hours for a growth to appear. Okay, Loeffler serum slant is another uh, media that you can isolate carinibacterium, carinibacterium diphtheria. The principle is serum and egg stimulates the production of metachromatic granules. Remember that metachromatic granules will show up um, if the organism is planted on Loeffler serum slant. So Loeffler serum slant will produce metachromatic granules inoculate and uh, incubate the same way. So, um, Briony bacterium diphtheria, you, you read it eight to 24 hours, prepare the smear, this process of specimen quickly within eight to 24 hours, prepare the smears, methylene blue, and hopefully you'll see straight curve or club shaped rods. These are gram positive rods. And uh, when you use the methylene blue, that stain will help you look for and see the metachromatic granules. You can't do it under the, the typical gram stain. You have to uh, look for metachromatic granules using methylene blue, okay? Methylene blue for the metachromatic granules. But on the gram stain, these are gram positive rods. On blood auger, you incubate it 37 degrees for 24 hours. Look for beta hemolysis, the gram stain, and it's and uh, do a catalase test. Cysteine telluride auger, observed for the telluride reduction. That means the blackening of the media. On the Loeffler serum media, look for metachromatic granules and pleomorphism. So cysteine telluride or the modified tisto, look for the telluride reduction. In the Loeffler serum medium, that's where you will um, look for metachromatic granules. Biochemicals and toxigenicity testing Toxigenicity testing, I'll be going over a specific test, but that's these are the um, media to rule out Carinibacterium diphtheria. There's the virulence testing, the toxigenicity test, and it's called the ELEC test, okay? So what it is, is that you have a paper strip with diphtheria antitoxin below the surface of the auger. So you have a strip that's embedded in the auger, and then you inoculate with your unknown and your controls incubated for 24 hours, 37 degrees, and look for a 45 degree angle precipitation, 45 degree angle precipitation. And what that looks like is here's your strip with the embedded antitoxin, that's the vertical. That's your strip with the um, embedded antitoxin. The top strip on the horizontal is your positive control. The, on the bottom, this is your negative control, okay? Now what you're looking for, and then the middle is you are um, testing 
your negative control and that's your middle strip. So what you're looking for is remember that 45 degree angle, if you can just barely see it, um, here is a 40, 45 degree angle of precipitation, kind of like a similar type of precipitation that you would see or growth in the um, X and V strips, okay? So, but this is a 45 degree angle. This is the ELEC test, and this is a positive reaction. Again, this is the positive control, and this is a strip with antitoxin. So this is positive where you would see growth of a 45 degree uh, angle. You look, at the, you look at your test, and you also see a 45 degree angle. So on this unknown specimen, it's positive test because it matches the positive control. And then you gotta make sure on your negative control, this is negative control here, that you don't see 45 degree angle lines, okay? So this is the ALEC test. Um, it's um, antitoxin embedded in a paper strip uh, and it's below uh, embedded below the surface of the auger. And then you streak positive control, your sample and your negative control. And then you look for the 45 degree angle lines. If you see those, then it's positive for Corinibacterium diphtheria. Okay. Uh, another test involves live animals. Uh, you inject antitoxin in your first guinea pig, two hours later injected with four mLs of unknown. Okay, so, and if you have it, the guinea pig will live. If you don't have it, I, I think it'll still live. But the second guinea pig, you just inject the unknown, and you don't give it the antitoxin. And if it's there, it'll die. If it's not there, it'll live. Okay, so the antitoxin is to keep the, keep the animal alive. And if you don't, and if you inject your unknown without the antitoxin, then unfortunately we have a dead guinea pig. So I don't like the live animal. There's a lot of disadvantages to using um, research studies with live animals, but I'm not gonna get into that. Tissue culture test. Okay, on the tissue culture test, uh, there's a way to detect carinid bacterium diphtheria and it, uh, to determine toxicity or neutralization of cytopathic effect. So what happens on a tissue culture is that on tissue culture, like on these bottles, on the side of the bottle, and this is how you, this is how you store the bottles. You have to store it laying down because right here you have your uh, nutrient medium, liquid medium uh, feeding into the cells. And the cells are actually, like probably mon monkey kidney. And it's a monolayer of monkey kidney tissue cells. And they're, they're it's striated muscle and it's very, very uniform. However, but in the presence of um, something that's positive like a uh, carinibacterium diphtheria, that uniform uh, layer of monolayer of monkey kidney muscle cells will get destroyed and then you'll see that destruction uh, and it's called cytopathic effect, okay? If the organism's presence, then you'll see the disruption of the, the monolayer and that's called cytopathic effect. And you can do PCR testing to detect toxin or the gene. Next organism is Listeria, Listeria monocytogenes, Listeria, okay? Uh, Listeria is another gram-positive rod. It's actually a, a kind of nice-looking gram-positive rod. It's not fat or club-shaped. It's a Listeria that looks like Enterobacteriaceae, but it's a gram-positive rod. Okay, occasionally gram-variable, but all the Listerias I've seen are very nice-looking gram-positive rods. Asporogenous, no spore. They're short. Can be cockabacillary to diphtheroidal. Um, but again, like I said, these are nice looking gram positive rods. Occasional change of form. The one few characteristics about Listeria is that it has biochemical characteristics similar to strep because Listeria is bioesculin positive. Remember bioesculin and group D strep? It's the same, okay? Group D strep is bioesculin positive and so is Listeria. It's modal. Uh, note that Listeria has two unique 
forms of motility, okay? Two unique forms of motility. Uh, and I'll get into that later. Um, Listeria grows over a wide temperature range. I think on your notes, it says 2.5 to 35. It's actually 25 to 35 degrees centigrade, 35 degrees, more than 35 degrees centigrade. So make sure you can uh, change that 2.5 to 25. It's halo tolerant, uh, up to 20% sodium chloride at four degrees for eight weeks. It ferments glucose. Again, another characteristic similar to strep is that it's camp positive. It's camp positive. And also to hippurate hydrolysis positive. So listeria is the one that's very similar to strep. Uh, the species that we're working with is usually listeria monocytogenes. Okay, clinical significance of listeria is that it's positive or it can cause listeriosis uh, in livestock and poultry. It's a prime reservoir uh, disease in a wide variety of fish, birds, and mammals. And it's an important pathogen associated with, a, 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 with abortion and encephalitis in sheep and cattle, okay? So farmers don't like, don't like it when they have listeria around because it'll cause abortion, spontaneous abortion and encephalitis in sheep and cattle. It's uncommon, but it's, very, it's a very significant human pathogen. Uh, it'll cause patients who are immunosuppressed to get bacteremia and meningitis. Uh, in healthy adults, you can get listeria, listeria infection from mild food poisoning. Uh, there's congenital transmission from uh, a mother passing it on to their unborn child. Humans, animals, found in humans, animals, soil, vegetables. Disease processes can cause meningitis, septicemia, and bacteremia. So this, this can be a very uh, a pretty bad organism. Genital infection with habitual abortion. So it's not good for females to have. Again, similar to group B strep, because remember, group B strep can cause habitual abortion. And nosocomial infections, but nosocomial infections are caused by a bunch of organisms. Zoonosis, uh, you get it from contact with infected animal tissues, like veterinarians can get listeria, livestock handlers, um, People who work in slaughterhouses can um, get listeriosis. Listeriosis is also associated with foodborne transmission, milk, meat, neonates, elderly, and, heat, and immunosuppressed. Sometimes when there's an outbreak, I don't know if you've heard it, and we haven't had it in a while, but listeria can cause infections and you can get it from dairy products. Like the one that comes to mind is like cheese. Certain cheeses, if it, uh, if there's a lot number that's positive for listeria, then you can have a pretty a, a short outbreak and they'll recall the product for being positive for listeria. So cheese, they're, they're, uh, dairy products, and, and meat, okay? Be careful with listeria. Laboratory description. Okay, so on blood auger, listeria is pinpoint or small translucent. Narrow zone of beta hemolysis. So again, a narrow zone of beta hemolysis is similar to group B strep. It looks like group B strep. In fact, when I was in training, um, the microbiology supervisor was very notorious in giving listeria to the CLS students. So I was unfortunate enough to do my micro rotation, the first one, and everybody was coaching me. Dan gives listeria, Dan gives listeria. So watch out, he's gonna give you listeria because in previous classes, that's what he did. He liked to give listeria. Uh, because it has characteristics similar to strep, I listened to my classmates and reported, my unknown has listeria and eh, I was wrong. It was, a, it was a beta strep group B. So listeria has those characteristics that are very similar to strep. The one, um, the two types of unique motility on listeria is that it has tumbling motility. And the tumbling motility, I, we have listeria in the laboratory. So I think uh, once we grow it, I'll get Danielle to grow it. I'm gonna try to see if we can get, do a hanging drop preparation and um, 
get you to witness the, the tumbling motility. It's really, it's really neat to watch. If you see the tumbling motility, it's like a, it's like a bicycle wheel on the loose and you actually see the spikes. So it, it actually tumbles. The other type of motility is on the OIM, the ornithine indole motility auger tube. So, which hasn't come in yet. So if, if it does come in, then all you do is you, you, you stab the tube uh, with the organism goes straight down and then come back out. You incubate it overnight and you'll see a characteristic umbrella like this. See the curve? So you stab, you stab straight down and come back out 24 hours later at the top of, near the top of the tube, you'll see a, the, the growth of the organism, but it's curved, almost looking like an umbrella. So that's umbrella motility. Okay, and then the other type of unique motility is tumbling motility. It's end over end. It's end over end, and we can demonstrate that on using the hanging drop method. Uh, can be confused with strep, like I was confused with strep because it's bilaskin and positive. This thing, these organisms will grow in 6.5% sodium chloride. It's camp positive and hippuric hydrolysis positive. So based on looking at that, um, I called it a strep, but, it's, but it was probably um, listeria. No, I called it listeria, but it was actually a strep. So there was confusion there. Cold and rich technique is used for specimens having heavily mixed flora. Incubate the, sp the specimens at uh, refrigeration temperature four degrees for one to six months. And that will enhance the stereo monocytogenes, continuous sump culture, and the organism will continue to grow. I mean, refrigeration temperatures. Um, what organism does that? You have, you know, I mean, it, usually organisms prefer 37 degrees, but this one will um, live at 40, four degrees centigrade. The next organism is Erysipelothrix. Erysipelothrix. Okay. Erysipelothrix is a gram positive rod, decolorizes easy uh, if, if the culture is old. Um, and Erysipelothrix uh, has a tendency to form long, unbranched filaments like that. This is actually, this is Erysipelothrix, but. Um, Lactobacillus looks like this, but these are gram positive rods. Erysipelothrix looks like this. <clears throat> uh, motility negative, so on the OIM, uh, you won't see any um, outbranching growth or umbrellas. It's catalase negative. However, the one characteristic, the one biochemical that's unique about erysipelothrix, and make sure you remember this, is that it's H2S positive. H2S positive, it's unusual for gram positive rod to be H2S positive. Unlike, unlike Listeria, Erysipelothrix is bile escalin negative. It ferments glucose. But the one biochemical that you need to remember for Erysipelothrix is that it's H2S positive. Erysipelothrix rhizopathy, that's the species. Okay, there's two types of diseases. The swine pathogen, two types of pathogens. The swine pathogen, if it is isolated from a swine, the disease is called erysipelas. If it's isolated from a human, it's called erysipeloid. Make sure you know the distinction because I believe you'll be asked that. So directly from a swine, it's erysipelas, and from the human disease, it's called erysipeloid. Okay. Um, persons greater at, at greatest risk are occupational, food handlers, butchers, fishermen, veterinarians, and probably people who work in slaughterhouses. Infrequently, you get endocarditis. Recommended specimens is biopsy tissue aspirin. Okay, so on blood auger, um, you, ha you have colonies with a fimbriated edge. Fimbriated means it's finger-like. <laughs> And excuse me, and simulates miniature anthrax type colonies because anthrax, and I'm going to be talking about that coming up, also has fibriated colonies. Uh, on blood auger, 
erysipelothrix is alpha hemolytic or gamma hemolytic. So it's green or not hemolytic at all. Laboratory description, it's negative for motility. Um, test tube brush pattern of growth. Lateral radi radiation, uh, radiating projections exhibited in the gelatin stab cultures or the OIM after incubation at 25 degrees for 48 hours. But it's considered motility negative, okay? Mo it's motility negative. So make sure you know this table here. And it's a dis distinction between erysipelothrix and listeria. So just know that listeria is beta, beta hemolytic. It's modal. Remember the motility tumbling motility and umbrella motility. It's catalase positive and it's bioleskulin positive. For erysipelothrix, the only thing that would be positive, and I told you to remember, is that it's H2S positive. Next organism is lactobacillus. Lactobacillus. General characteristics, this, this is a gram-positive rod. Uh, no spores. Uh, chain formation is common. It looks like I mentioned earlier that it looks like erysipelothrix end-to-end, kind of like long rods, filamentous. Lactobacillus produces lactic acid, okay? It produces lactic acid from glucose as a major metabolic end product. So, but biochemically, lactobacillus doesn't do anything. It's catalase negative, it's motility negative, H2S negative, and it's bioleskulin negative. So it really doesn't do much other than producing lactic acid. There's taxonomy. I'm not going to skip over taxonomy. Identification of species is not, ne not necessary. Uh, even though there are several uh, species of lactobacillus, you report lactobacillus, the doctor will say, okay, lactobacillus is probably contaminant. And it's a very common contaminant in your female urine samples. Clinical significant, again, prominent flora, vaginal, colon, mouth, or part, you know, or part of mixed flora. Occasionally involved in human infection, but not all the time. Like I said, lactobacillus present, nobody's going to care because it's part of normal flora. Rarely isolated, causing bacteremia, UTI, and separative infections. And if it does cause that, it's because it may be opportunistic. Uh, it has unusual pathogenicity because it's found everywhere. Okay, it's commensal and it's found everywhere. Colony morphology on blood and chocolate. It likes blood and chocolate, but these are alpha hemolytic, okay? Alpha, alpha hemolytic on blood and chocolate, chocolate is usually it's not significant uh, compared to like the viridans. Remember viridans on blood and chocolate, though, those colonies are also alpha hemolytic. So anything that's alpha hemolytic is probably not gonna be clinically significant. Commercial use. Lactobacillus, which you probably heard of, dairy industry application, uh, probiotic fermented dairy products, yogurt, acidophilus milk, Bulgarian milk, etc. Cultures of lactobacilli are important in cheese manufacturing to elicit the curdling of milk. Okay, so lactobacillus is important in commercial and industry, dairy industry application. So here's a table that you also need to. Uh, Make sure you memorize. Uh, it's not that difficult. Carini and Listeria are catalase positive and the other two are not. So it's Carinibacterium, Listeria, Erysipelothrix, and Lactobacillus. Both of these guys are like catalase positive. And then the other reactions are pr pretty much either going to be Listeria or Erysipelothrix. All the reactions are negative. Listeria is positive motility. You know that from umbrella and tumbling motility. H2S positive, erysipelothrix. And then esculin, the bioesculin, and beta hemolysis is again listeria. So listeria is positive for most of the reactions except for H2S. H2S is erysipelothrix. And there's that boring lactobacillus, negative for everything. Okay, lactobacillus is negative for everything. Carinia is catalase and positive, and listeria is catalase positive. All the other ones are our definition of listeria or erysipelothrix. So this table is really not that hard to memorize. The next organism, we're almost there, is bacillus. Oh, yeah, we're almost there. Uh, these are gram-positive rods. 
And these are spore forming, endospore forming, meaning that spores at the end of the end of the um, the rod. Okay, catalase positive, motility positive, it's bacillus taxonomy, clinical significance, bacillus subtilis. A habitat is arid dust, common, it's common contaminant. This is not the main pathogen, rarely causes food poisoning and causes opportunistic infections. This is the main pathogen for bacillus, okay? Bacillus anthracis <clears throat> that causes anthrax. And you can get bacillus, it's actually used as a bioweapon. And the reason why it's a good bioweapon is because it it's easily penetrates the skin for cutaneous, it's easily inhaled for pulmonary, and it's easily consumed in food. So it's gastrointestinal. So three uh, ways that it'll, it can cause disease, cutaneous, pulmonary, and gastrointestinal. And that's what makes it a good bioweapon. Okay, spores in the lungs, on the skin, and uh, the, it doesn't show, but it's gastrointestinal. More uh, cutaneous. Next organism is B. serious, uh, Bacillus serious, can cause food poisoning two types. The two types of food poisoning for Bacillus serious is diarrhea and emetic, emetic. Uh, opportun opportunistic infection, endocarditis, bacteremia, traumatic eye infection. And then finally, Bacillus sterothermophilus. Bacillus sterothermophilus. And this organism is used as sterility control. Uh, as the name implies, sterothermophilus means it high, likes high temperature. It's thermophilic. It'll grow at 65 degrees and it's more resistant to heat. The spores occur in soil in all climatic zones. Laboratory description. Okay, Bacillus anthracis. Anthracis has what's called a Medusa head on blood auger. Okay, the Medusa head is like, remember the fimbriated uh, edges that look like fingers? It actually, so that's what, this is what Bacillus looks like. Actually, when when media come in, it's, it's one of the common contaminants. So if Bacillus gets into your media and um, gets onto your plates, it's, it's annoying as a contaminant, but it's just regular non-pathogenic bacillus because it's everywhere. And this is the Medusa head. So at the end of the colonies, you'll see these fimbriated edges. Uh, more, much more closely, this is what you'll see. And that's why they call it a Medusa head. Okay, this is bacillus. This is also bacillus. And this is actually what a plate would look like if it's contaminated with uh, bacillus. And then and on, along the edge here, you can see that it's beta hemolytic, but the edges are called fimbriated. Okay, it looks like fingers. Bacillus anthracis colony morphology. The colonies show tenacity when manipulated, meaning that you have bacillus anthracis when you hand when you um, um, play with the colony, it'll it'll it's thick. The colony is thick so that when you try to pull it up, it'll stay up like that. Or when you drag it, it'll stay out like that. So that's what it means when the, the colonies will show tenacity when manipulated, okay? Um, bacillus series is beta hemolytic uh, variable, and it'll also cause the Medusa. Um, here, you see that it's beta hemolytic, but on the edge, you'll probably see the Medusa. Bacillus sub subtilis, um, blood auger, variable, round, irregular, closely resembles pseudomonas. And if you remember what pseudomonas looks like on blood, remember the fish scales, the silvery. Okay, that's what bacillus subtilis look like. Safety precautions, when, when you're using bacillus, you gotta be careful with, especially the bacillus anthracis because you can inhale it. Remember, the three modes of transmission are inhalation, skin contact and ingestion, uh, gastrointestinal. So make sure that if you have a bacillus it's suspicious, make sure you use a biological safety cabinet. Uh, disinfect all benches and space, prevent aerosolization, okay? Make sure you are under that hood. 
And if you do get bacillus anthracis, it is reportable to the state public health laboratory or centers for disease control. Bacillus anthracis are large rod with flattened ends, uh, long chains resembling a jointed bamboo rod. Okay, so on the gram stain, these look like bam bamboo rods like this. Okay, this is bacillus anthracis. Bacillus serious rods tend to be formed chains, which means that it's end to end. And same with bacillus subtilis, uh, does not form chains. But serious forms chains, but uh, bacillus subtilis are just regular rods and do not form chains. Don't worry about this table. I don't like anything that has variable in it. Um, and then there's susceptibility testing with penicillin G, 10 units. But I don't like to memorize this table. And I'm not going to make you memorize it because of this variable. Okay. Finally, we're almost at the end. I apologize for this long, grueling lecture. But Bacillus stereothermophilus. There's what's called a killet ampule. Okay, and the killet ampule is quality control when you sterilize uh, like glassware or instruments. Okay, so they'll throw in a killet ampule, and the killet ampule contains Bacillus stereothermophilus. Okay, so the the pre procedures you treat it like an unknown. And after sterilization, you look for growth, no growth. If there's growth, that means the organism survived and uh, it was unsus unsuccessful sterilization. If there's no growth, then you reached a high enough temperature that you killed that you killed the stereothermophilus. So growth, make sure you know the reaction. Growth is unsuccessful sterilization. No growth is successful sterilization. Okay, so these are spore strips called killet spore strips. These are filter paper impregnated with spores, dehydrated culture media, and pH indicator. Procedure, you sterilize, uh, the same for sterilization. Interpretation, turbidity, growth means it's not sterile. If you get growth, not sterile, unsuccessful sterilization. If you get no growth, it's sterile, successful sterilization. Oh, thank you. All right. Are there any questions on these long lectures? This is the last bacteriology, bacteriology lecture that you will get, okay, of, of this class. Because now we're going to be getting into mycology and then uh, we'll phase into parasitology. So are there any questions? Probably not because you're focusing on your antibiotics right now. So I gave you a review. It's like bullets of, of the matching. Make sure you're able to match whatever with whatever, which, which antibiotic with which group, whether it's RNA synthesis, cell wall synthesis, et cetera. So make sure you know the antibiotics that belong to each respective group. Make sure you know the synthetic antibiotic like, like the Zosin and the, the Augmentin, et cetera. But we'll go over this in um, uh, the review tomorrow, okay? Again, we'll probably do AFB stains, uh, AFB staining tomorrow. Um, we have some Candida albicans, which is yeast. Since we're getting into mycology, it'll be um, good for you to see what yeast look like microscopically. And then there's another test, which I'll reserve for next week, and that's the germ tube test. And that's specific for Candida albicans. All right. Are there any questions? Apologize for the long lecture, but um, it's good that we got these lectures out of the way because now it paves the way for me to lecture on mycology and get you ready for parasitology. Because parasitology, there are no exams, just, just like, for example, um, the malaria life cycle and then the slides. The big thing about parasitology is to know how to identify the slides. And we're gonna go over the slides multiple times so that you will eventually memorize all the slides, okay? So if there are no questions, then I'll see you tomorrow. And I, like I said in my email, I was pretty happy with the results of your exam. Everybody's grade increased. 
uh, if you if you were barely getting a certain grade, it became better, a stronger. And then if you were borderline, you became less borderline and having a good shot of getting that grade that you um, really want. Okay. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow. Have a good evening. Have a good night. Good evening. Good night.